تداعيات الحرب على العراق بالنسبة لي كفرد وبالنسبة للمجتمع العراقي كثيرة أولها الجانب السياسي وهي الفوضى اللي شهدها العراق بعد عام 2003 عدم وجود نظام سياسي رصيد العراق ما زال يدفع الكثير من الدماء On the 6th of July, a long-awaited report into the war in Iraq called the Chilcot Inquiry is released. Saddam Hussein was undoubtedly a brutal dictator who had attacked Iraq's neighbors, repressed and killed many of his own people, and was in violation of obligations imposed by the UN Security Council. We have concluded that the UK chose to join the invasion of Iraq before the peaceful options for disarmament had been exhausted. Military action at that time was not a last resort. Despite explicit warnings, the consequences of the invasion were underestimated. The planning and preparations for Iraq after Saddam Hussein were wholly inadequate. It's taken years for this report to come out, so over the next few weeks, you're gonna hear a lot about Iraq, Tony Blair, dodgy dossiers, George W. Bush, intelligence, war crimes, the war on terror, the rise of ISIS, and so much more. To think of Iraq today, probably the first thing that comes to mind is ISIS. In Iraq, the death toll from Saturday's car bombing in Baghdad has topped 250, making it the deadliest car bombing in that country since the 2003 U.S. invasion. The sudden rise of ISIS is due to many factors, some specific to Iraq, some specific to Syria, but fundamentally ISIS is a creature of geopolitical upheaval. The organization has spread through the Middle East, driven by power struggles between Sunni Muslim states led by Saudi Arabia and Shia Muslim states led by Iran. ISIS arose from the ashes of the war in Iraq, which was launched in 2003 by the US and aided by the UK. We did not want this war, but in refusing to give up his weapons of mass destruction, Saddam gave us no choice but to act. It was a controversial war even then, with millions of people in the UK taking to the streets to protest against it. Despite that, Parliament, led by Tony Blair's government, voted overwhelmingly to launch the war. The justification given was that Iraq was supposedly a threat to global safety and pursuing weapons of mass destruction, a claim that we now know to be false. It concludes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, that Saddam has continued to produce them, that he has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes, including against his own Shia population. Despite claims of how threatening Iraq was in the build-up to war, the invasion showed that Iraq barely put up a resistance. This was because Iraq was not the great, powerful threat that Parliament had claimed, but a poor, weak country that was easily invaded, and the Iraqi regime, led by Saddam Hussein, was toppled. The consequences of the war for the Iraqi people was devastating, for while the invasion may have been quick, the war lasted eight years and claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Some claim even a million were killed. And the human impact beyond loss of life is incalculable. <laughs> But Britain's role in Iraq and its cooperation with its closest ally, the United States, did not begin with Tony Blair and the war in 2003. On August the 2nd, 1990, after a dispute over shared oil fields, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Four days later, the United Nations Security Council imposed economic sanctions, the most comprehensive in modern history. Almost everything was denied the people of Iraq, including, for the first eight months, food and medicine. 
the UN, with the enthusiastic backing of the US and UK, had imposed sanctions on Iraq. For Iraqis, it meant often being cut off from access to basic goods and services, including some food and medicine, needed to lead a decent quality of life, as well as having an economy that's on its knees. The conditions brought about by these sanctions were so extreme that they were labelled genocidal by Dennis Halliday, the United Nations humanitarian coordinator in Iraq, who resigned in protest in 1998. These are the people of Iraq, the silent victims, not only of Saddam Hussein, their dictator, but of an endless war against civilians waged by Western governments. But why did the UK and the US care so much about Saddam? To understand that, you need to know a little more about how Saddam came to power. In 1958, Abd al-Karim Qasim, an Iraqi army officer, seized power from the monarchy and became ruler of Iraq. This didn't sit well with Britain, who'd been closely associated with the old regime, which had now been overthrown. But it didn't last long. In 1963, Qasim was overthrown and killed with the aid of the CIA, because he was seen to not be acting in the best interests of the US. And guess who played a role in that CIA conspiracy? That's right. Saddam Hussein, although he was just a young man then. After some back and forth, Saddam gained power of Iraq in 1979 before embarking in a brutal war with neighbouring Iran. It was during this war with Iran that Iraq did have chemical weapons and used them with the complicit support of the US. The UK also helped to arm Iraq during this period. So, it's incredibly ironic that in 2003, these states turned around and launched a war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq when it was incredibly weak and didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Oil plays a big role in this. Our economies were, and still are, very dependent on oil, and Iraq has a lot of it. What happens to the people living on the ground in these countries hasn't been a priority. <laughs> راحت انتهت شو يعني شو وايد شغلات تاثر علينا هاي هاي اقتصاد يعني دمر نتيجة هاي الحرب يعني قانون اي قانون اي دولة ماكو اه هواي شغلات تغيرت بالبلد نتيجة هاي الحرب دخلوا رهابيين هاي التفجات جاء صير يومية احنا كشباب يعني نخاف نطلع and this takes us back even further to when Iraq was first established as a state which is where a lot of the problems for Iraq and the Middle East begin. Mr Sykes, with Monsieur Picot, uh, who was a, a, a French civil servant, in secret, in Paris and London, drew up during the First World War a map of the Middle East deciding which countries would effectively own which parts of the old Ottoman Empire. On the basis of Sykes and Picot, in fact, the French got Syria and Lebanon, Britain got all of Iraq, Jordan, Palestine. And the idea was that instead of giving immediate independence to the Arabs, which we'd promised, we would run these countries for them. That's right. An English guy and a French guy drew lines on a map and said, you have this, we'll have that, without really considering what was going on in those countries. Many of the modern day Arab states were created. Often, frontiers were drawn arbitrarily. Europeans used straight lines on maps to demarcate areas often with no ethnic or tribal considerations. And some modern analysts believe decisions by the French and British then created the conditions for the battles of today. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's literally what happened. We're still seeing the consequences of this decision today as the basis of sykes picot and Ravels. So, if you only look at Tony Blair and George W. Bush when looking at the involvement of the US and the UK in Iraq, you're missing the bigger point. Tony Blair recently defended the war in Iraq, but even he admitted that the planning had been insufficient as to what would happen after they deposed Saddam. I can also apologise, by the way, for some of the mistakes in planning and certainly our mistake in, in, in our understanding of what would happen once you removed the regime. That is a bit of an understatement. The chaos in Iraq was one of the major factors that led to groups like ISIS having room to grow. And ISIS has connections to Saddam's old party. With reports that ISIS command personnel and infrastructure is heavily based on disaffected former Ba'athist generals who were left as outsiders and disaffected 
after the toppling of Saddam Hussein. How could this happen? Imagine for a second that Britain had another country interfering in its politics and internal affairs for over a hundred years, like Britain and America have done in Iraq. That various rulers had been overthrown, that millions had died in war, that access to medicine had been denied, that resources had been exploited, and even the construction of the country itself didn't put the population first. It's hard to think of that happening, isn't it? How do you think we would feel? What would the country look like? وبالتالي يعني مو حتى الشباب هنا ما عنده لا شغل يخلص شهادته ما عنده ما عنده وظيفه. اتمنى على الشباب البريطاني انه يحسون بمعاناتنا. لا قلت تقبل انه هذا الوضع اللي جاي يصير بي انت يصير بيك؟ يعني تقبل انه يحتل يجي تجي تحتل احتل بلدك؟ Iraq is not the exception and it isn't just the UK and the US doing this. Many other countries have had similar experiences and maybe we need to ask ourselves why is this happening and what can we do to change it? If you found this video helpful, share it with your friends and let us know what you think in the comments below. My mistake on the first round was that everywhere I tried telling the story myself. The second time, I let people tell their story and tried giving it a context and a frame.